Hello and welcome to Biology 1620. I'm Professor Braselton and today we're going to talk about the Cambrian explosion. So far in this class we have covered all of the major branches of the tree of life. We've talked about archaea a little bit, methanogens being the archaea example of archaea. We've talked about bacteria in various ways. We've talked about all of the different super kingdoms of the eukarya including the algae and diatoms and dinoflagellates and um, slime molds. We've talked about the plants, we've talked about fungi, and now we're talking about the animals, just one little branch on the overall tree of life. And we'll talk about the animals for the rest of this course. Here's our phylogeny of the eukarya once again. And what we want to point out now is that <clears throat> the sister group of the animals is the coenoflagellates. The animals, the coenoflagellates, and the fungi together make up supergroup opisthokonts. And in order to understand what animals are, let's just spend a few minutes exploring these weirdos called the coenoflagellates. Here is a diagram of a coenoflagellate cell. It's a single cell with a single flagellum, which is the thing that binds all of the opisthokonts together. And the flagellum is how the, uh, the quinoflagellate cell uh, moves around in its environment. The interesting thing about quinoflagellates and the thing that makes them uh, important for understanding the evolution of animals is that they are colonial animals. So they are um, uh, single-celled organisms, but single-celled organisms who can come together into aggregates and colonies. So um, first of all, it's important to know that quinoflagellates are heterotrophs. They feed by phagocytosis, as many uh, single-celled eukaryotes do. Um, they are mostly free swimming, but they can also attach to a substrate by a stalk, which is what's being shown here. So they can be sessile as well as free moving. And um, they can form these colonies. And that's uh, a very interesting observation because of an image like this. So based on what I just told you, what would you say this image is showing? And I'll point out that here are many uh, individual cells, each one with uh, flagella coming out of the cells and they have aggregated together into this group. So does that look like a quinoflagellate to you? I think so. Each one of these cells kind of looks like a quinoflagellate cell. But in fact, that's an image of a sponge, which is the first phylum of proper animals that we're going to talk about. So here's a diagram showing what we were seeing in that uh, actual image of sponge tissue. Each one of those coanoflagellate-like cells is uh, called a coanocyte in the context of a sponge um, because of its similarity to the coanoflagellate. Coano means collar. So both the quinoflagellate cell and the quinocyte of a sponge has this collar around the flagellum. And the sponge uses the quinocytes to create a current of water that brings food into the body of the sponge. But the sponge is different than a quinoflagellate in that it has many other types of cells as well. So in addition to the quinocytes, it has um, um, actual differentiated tissues, each one with a specialized function. It even has an epidermis like you would normally think of with animals. So this um, anatomy of a sponge uh, has been used as really strong evidence for a while now that the quinoflagellates and this type of heterotrophic cell with a flagellum is the ancestral state of the animals. And the sponge is sort of like a transitional form between a single-celled quinoflagellate and a, spun, and, a, and a more complex animal that we normally think about. So before we move on to the other animals, just a, a couple of minutes to talk about sponges because they're pretty important organisms uh, ecologically. They pump tons and tons of water. Five, um, every five seconds, they pump an amount of water equal to their own volume. They, when, as they're pumping the water, they're basically cleaning it. So they remove 95% of bacteria, 90% of the overall carbon from the water um, as they pump the water through their, their bodies because that's how they eat. They eat that uh, carbon that's in the water. 
And by doing that, they are retaining the carbon in the ecosystem. So instead of that carbon just uh, flowing by in the ocean currents, the sponges trap that carbon inside their bodies, and that um, retains the carbon in the ecosystem and makes it available for other organisms in the ecosystem. So this has uh, been proposed as one of the reasons why coral reef ecosystems are so diverse, um, because of all that carbon retaining in the system instead of just flowing by. So just to be clear, coral are actual uh, animals. They are cnidarians instead of sponges. So the animals that make the coral itself, um, those aren't sponges. But a coral reef ecosystem is very diverse and has many, many, many different animals. And sponges are one of those important animals uh, for that reason. All right, we uh, are mostly mentioning sponges right now as our introduction to the animals and to talk about what is an animal, what is uh, the set of characteristics that all animals from sponges to mammals and everything in between have in common. And so we can say that an animal is multicellular, even a sponge is multicellular, as we saw in, compared, in comparison to the quantiflagellates. They're aerobic, all animals use oxygen, and it has been pointed out that the rise in oxygen levels was probably a requirement for animals to have evolved in the first place because they are inherently aerobic organisms. And a special characteristic of animals is that they obtain their food by, by capturing it in some way. So a cheetah captures their food in ways that you're familiar with. A sponge even captures its food by uh, having water flow through its body and capturing the food particles out of the water. So that's something that both sponges and mammals have in common. And if you compare this to, for example, the fungi, which uh, obtain their food in a very, very different way by excreting enzyme, enzymes into their extracellular environment and then digesting the molecules that are released by the enzymatic activity. That's a very different way of getting food than the way animals get food. Uh, animals are always mobile during at least one stage of their life cycle. So even though sponges don't move, they just kind of uh, sit there, sponge larvae are actually free swimming and can move. So that's something that all animals have in common. All animals reproduce sexually. Um, there are interesting exceptions, as always in biology, but those interesting exceptions are the exceptions that prove the rule. Uh, they, are, they had uh, evolved from sexual ancestors, even if they don't have much sexual reproduction now. Uh, and more specifically, all animals use the diplontic life cycle. If you remember our three different types of sexual reproductive life cycles, animals are diplontic, which means that the adults are diploid and they produce haploid gametes, and those haploid gametes are the only haploid phase of the life cycle. Of the life cycle, so that's the opposite of the haplontic life cycle, for example. And finally, animals have specialized tissues that are derived from different layers that are formed during the early stages of development. And this is something we're going to talk about a lot more later in this lecture. But to introduce the concept to you now. You've probably seen a diagram like this once in a previous biology class, but um, as a quick review, um, all animals, of course, develop from a zygote, which is the single-celled diploid stage that forms during fertilization, um, or as a result of fertilization. The zygote um, goes, uh, undergoes some rounds of mitosis until you have about eight cells. After you have about eight cells, then you form this hollow ball that is called a blastula. So inside the blastula is a hollow sphere. And this is unique to animals. Other organisms don't, uh, other multicellular organisms don't develop in exactly this way. And then most animals also then um, go through a phase that is called gastrulation, in which um, the surface of the hollow sphere, the blastula, pinches in and forms a more complex three-dimensional shape that then gives rise to the different germ layers that uh, give rise to different specialized tissues and organs. So for example, our circulatory system and our nervous system and our digestive system systems develop from different layers already in this very early stage of development where it doesn't even look like an animal yet, but it's already setting the stage for those more complicated uh, stages of development. And this is the thing that really makes animals different from all other types of organisms. Uh, fungi, for example, do not develop in this way at all. They have the mycelia that grow in a very linear fashion, and they never have belt blastulas or gastrulas. Plants have uh, things like germ layers, 
and develop in a somewhat analogous way, but it is analogous, not homologous. That is to say that plants develop their multicellular developmental stages um, as an example of convergent evolution. They evolved theirs independently from animals. So here are the animals. This is the phylogenetic tree that we are going to um, really study closely for the rest of this lecture. Here are the sponges. The technical name for the sponges is phylum periphera. And you can see that it is a basal branch. It is um, the ancestral, uh, it, it, it uh, is derived from this ancestral node, the last common ancestor of all of the animals. Um, other groups of animals include uh, echinoderms, like sea stars, vertebrates, which involve, uh, includes us, uh, mollusks, uh, include snails, for example, annelids, are uh, earthworms, and arthropods are a big one that includes um, all insects, for example, and the cnidarians are things like jellyfish. And we are going to um, spend a lot of time uh, talking more about these organisms, in particular later in the course, we're gonna really focus on the vertebrates for obvious reasons and on the arthropods. So as your self-quiz for this part of the lecture, I want you to think about what traits are shared by all of the animals on this tree. What are, what are the things that all animals have in common from sponges to vertebrates to arthropods? So answer that for yourself and I will see you in the part two video.